Harvest Chapel. Good morning, Harvest Chapel friends, family, associates, colleagues, troublers of Israel, and others. This is Joe Whitchurch. This is 10 at 10. Actually, a little today. It is 10 at 10 on Thursday, but it's not 10 o'clock. <laughs> it's closer to 10.45. And speaking of 10.45, five, 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 we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 5 today. Fabulous uh, text of scripture. Um, yes, so just, just in brief, I wanted to say thanks, Trent, for the heads up about the worship uh, event being rescheduled. And uh, everybody is invited to spread the word to your mature junior high and high schoolers that on October 17th, Saturday, we're going to be having Arrow, the Ask, Evaluate, and Relate with Optimism, Apologetics, Evangelism, Relationally Optimistic, Helping High Schoolers and Junior Hires Ask, Answer, Tough Questions event. So Put it in your calendar. I don't care if you're going to a game, if you're going to a corn maze, or you're getting ready for Halloween, or you're having a party. Get those high schoolers down to our, our church on Saturday, October 17th for Arrow. Now, back to um, Luke chapter 5. You know, the chapter starts off with a guy that's, uh, well, it doesn't really start with that guy. It starts with the uh, with a guy named Simon Peter who's told to put down his net for a catch. He doesn't want to do it because he's been fishing all night. He follows the Lord's um, instructions, but it turns out that he can't, um, he can't really do it in faith. He just does it out of the thing. But Jesus reveals to him that he is, in fact, not only um, the leader, the rabbi, the teacher, the prophet, but the one who is in control of nature, which is, God incarnate, second person of the Trinity, by filling those nets with so many fish <laughs> that the nets started to break and they need to fill, uh, send out for another boat to help bring it in uh, because the boat started to sink. And Peter says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. That's pretty amazing. And they were all pretty astonished. The next passage in Luke chapter 5 is uh, the leper. And a man comes to Jesus who has not just got some leprosy on his hand or something terminal on his forehead of leprosy, but it says his body was full of leprosy. Oh, Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, which would make Jesus ceremonial ceremonially, according to Jewish law, unclean, unable to go to the temple. But he is the one who takes our sins into his body on the tree so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him by taking our sins. And this is kind of a, a precursor to that. He touches the leper without regard, apparently, for his own health. says, I will be clean. And immediately, all that body that was full of leprosy that left Jesus and he charged the leper to tell no one but to go and show himself first to the priest, make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded, for a proof and a, you know, a witness to them as well, what's going on. But now even more, the report about him, Jesus, uh, went abroad and, and uh, about the, the healing as well. And great crowds gathered to hear him, but mainly to come to get healed, right? Who wants to spend money on medicine and doctors? Why not just come and get the healing. Well, the passage I really wanted to focus on today is this, this third one, uh, where Jesus heals the paralytic, the guy that can't move his legs, uh, pretty much incapacitated, um, not intellectually though. So the passage says, on one of those days when people were coming <laughs> in large groups uh, to get healed, and not on a day when Jesus pulled away for prayer, because Jesus was not swayed by crowds of the applause of men, even though lots of people were coming he still made time for prayer and communion, and he seems to be living a life of prayer, right, to, as a second person of the Trinity, and yet fully human as well. So it says on one of those days he was teaching, the Pharisees and the teachers of the laws were sitting there. They'd all come to see the show as well, apparently. Um, 
but it wasn't advertised as a show. They just knew stuff happened around Jesus. Clarity happens. And they came from uh, every village of Galilee and Judea, from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing to him a man on a bed who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way in because of the crowd. Apparently it was in a house, right? So they went up on the roof of this establishment and let him down on his bed through the tiles in the midst uh, where Jesus was. Into the midst before Jesus. We know Jesus was in the midst of the cross between the two thieves on, on Calvary. But now the needy person who is powerless to save himself is there dangling before God and man and religious hypocrites and everyone because his friends want him to be healed. Isn't that sweet? That really is wonderful. How it was great to have friends like that who would take extraordinary measures to bring people to Jesus. And I'm sure he was willing to go, but maybe now that he's dangling there, he may be having some embarrassing uh, self-conscious thoughts. Uh, we don't know that for sure. But what we do know for sure is in verse 20, with Luke chapter 5, it says, And when he saw their faith, this is referring to Jesus, seeing their faith in action. Whose faith? The, the friends? Uh, Jesus' faith? I mean, uh, Jesus saw the paralytic's faith. I mean, probably all of their faith that are involved in this enterprise. He said, man, to the man whose name he apparently uh, doesn't yet know. Man, person created in God's image. <laughs> We're studying about that in Genesis and Bible study fellowship and others that are going through the book of Genesis. We're looking at human dignity and wondering about our common humanity and dignity and a great sanctity and yet fallenness. Man, you're broken. You're, you're a leper. I mean, not a leper. You're a paralytic. You can't move your arms or your legs. Man, he says, your sins are forgiven you. Whoa, well, that's not what he came for. But apparently that's what he was looking for at the deepest recesses of his life. And, of course, the religious establishment goes berserk. Verse 21 says, The scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Good question. Who can ultimately forgive sins but God alone? Every sin we do has implications. Either sins of omission, of things that we didn't do that may have rippled out to the glory of God, playing it forward, or things that we did do that dehumanized others or insensitized ourselves, or, or failed to honor and glorify God and to empower and to help people who were created in his image. Who is this who speaks these blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone, they ask. Actually, a good theological question. Next verse. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he knew their thinking. Not just the man dangling, not the, just the faith of the people that brought him, but the people that are asking questions. Before they ask the question, he perceives their thoughts, and he answers them, their thoughts, <laughs> their perceptions, and says... Why do you question in your heart which is easier to say? Your sins be forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man, his favorite term referring to himself as Messiah indirectly, but in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, which he will ultimately do on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, at uh, his crucifixion, uh, on that first Good Friday, in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, an authority he knows he has, an authority that's on the basis of the blood atonement of his, his substitutionary death on the cross, he said to the man who was paralyzed in front of the others, <laughs> I say to you, rise. Rise? How's he supposed to do that without legs? Pick up your bed. How's he supposed to do that without hands? And go home. And immediately the man rose up before them all, picked up what he had been lying on and uh, with his hands, and glorified God. And amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with all, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Well, we know when Jesus hushed the, the seas of that great storm, the disciples says, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? We know that they were totally astonished at the catch of fish 
And they said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. We know that he was able to instantly cleanse a man whose body was full of leprosy. And now he heals a man who is uh, paralytic and does so in a way to draw attention to the religious leaders and establishment and base of power at the time that they too needed their sins forgiven and to trust in a Messiah to be the sin bearer. They don't get the full picture yet, but they're starting to get the picture. And some of them are astonished and glorified God. I'm sure others were jealous and they were still debating it in their minds uh, theologically. Luke goes on, Dr. Luke, I might add, the, one of the Gentile writers in the New Testament goes on to talk a lot. There he goes on out from that place and calls a tax collector. Tax collector is a co collaborator with Rome. You know, he's taxing the Jewish people. They're famous for uh, cheating their own people. Um, but he says to this, this tax collector, uh, we know now from the other Gospels, is Matthew, he says, follow him. Follow me, Jesus says. And immediately that tax collector <laughs> left his stuff and began to follow his apprentice and, uh, and disciple or learner of Jesus Christ. Sometimes people call that a slave master. It's not slavery like the American experience. It's an apprenticeship. Yes, he's the master because he's Lord of everything. And yes, we are his followers, bond servants, willing servants. Um, but this Matthew go, goes on to follow. And then uh, now that they're faced with uh, Jesus' power in many different ways, they begin to get into a discussion about fasting and how to fast and eschatology and so forth. <laughs> but uh, it is interesting how Jesus uh, not only um, has supernatural powers because he is the Son of God, um, and also uh, the Spirit is, of God is with him. And also because he has a good character and he uses his power to empower others. But he also is a sin bearer and forgiver. And ultimately we'll do this through the cross, through the resurrection where he conquered leprosy, but sin and actually death itself for everyone. And that while we were yet sinners, all of our sins, and I'm talking to people today, were future when Jesus died. While we were sinning, Christ died for us. This is how God demonstrated his love towards us. So the, he is a wonderful savior. He saves us deeper than what we think or expect. And he doesn't leave us unchanged when we interact with him. And he is worthy of our bringing our friends to him. Even people with deep physical, emotional, uh, spiritual, even theological questions and needs. And he is quite able to uh, manifest himself and to reveal himself and to draw people to himself. So let's get uh, on with the business of drawing people to him as well. So pray for those friends that are discouraged, depressed, locked in, shut in, isolated. Pray for those friends that are prideful on the outside, but you don't know what kinds of brokenness and insecurity they have on the inside. Pray for those people that are alienated from friends, family, and other people because of saying or doing different things that they want them to do related to the election or political causes or or this event or that event and interpretations on it. Pray for people. Uh, Jesus says we're supposed to love even our enemies. So how about that? It's a supernatural life, this Christian life, and because we follow a Lord who is both fully man. He incarnates. He's into our experience, into our flesh, um, in terms of taking on a human body, and is also Lord and sovereign over everything, so we can trust him. Let's close with the word of prayer because I see the hour just crested into 11 o'clock and 10 at 10 can't go beyond 11. That would just be against the rules. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is in control of everything and yet he allows us to discover who he is. The son of man, the healer, the forgiver, the one that touches lepers. So the leprosy leaves them and yet, is he defiled or not defiled? How does that work? We thank you he's coming again. We thank you he conquered death. We thank you he died in our place. Help us, Lord, to be uh, and do, to be in our character and to do that which reflects his glory and draws people to see him up close and personal. That uh, Jesus' life... Uh, how could anybody invent this? He is so far ahead of his time in character and dignity 
in the use of power. There's no first century community or group of people that could invent something like this. I certainly couldn't dream this stuff up. How could this happen? Well, it's because it's true. We thank you, God, that you are true and you don't lie and you speak and you don't stutter and you preserve your word so that we might read it and understand who Jesus is and be drawn to him in living faith. Thank you for your grace and mercy towards us and for opening the scriptures to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks, 10 and 10 people, for still tuning into these, even though uh, the COVID restrictions are lightening up. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And if you're interested in the uh, ARO, A-E-R-O, Outreach to High Schoolers and Junior Hires, come to the crossing, 1019 Wabash Avenue, this afternoon, Thursday, 4 p.m. And we'll talk about a little review of what's happened in the past and vision casting for the future and, uh, and list your ideas for this coming one. God bless. Have a fabulous day.